Yes, there is actually a medical condition that actually causes your dick to get too big, sometimes even resulting in surgery. It's called macrophallus, penile gigantism, macro penis. It all basically means the same thing and we're gonna talk about it today. And so uh, just to start, I know this is a little bit of a different background. I'm actually at home today, actually off uh, for part of this week. So that's why there's a slightly different get up, slightly different garb. Uh, but I still wanted to get some videos out, so uh, let's discuss today. And so the first thing we're going to talk about is there's something that's called, I like to refer to it as megalophallus. Like I said, it's penile gigantism, macro penis. It's all the same thing. And basically what happens is that uh, you develop a physiologically abnormally large penis uh, from, could be a variety of different things. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about basically one variety that basically occurs when for some reason there is an dilation of the tunica, which causes the, so the tunica apogenia, apogenia, however you want to say it, um, actually dilates and you get an enlargement in your girth as a result. And so normally this is caused by sickle cell anemia. And so for those that don't know what that is, but basically your red blood cells should be circular, but instead they're actually shaped like a sickle or like kind of like a, like a curved C. And as a result, this can lead to problems with uh, priapism. And so one thing that can result from the, the priapism is actually called, you know, megalophallus. And so first paper we're going to discuss is actually, it actually looked at the pathophysiology. So basically how does priapism occur in sickle cell anemia? Basically, when you have sickle cell anemia, there are different vascular areas that are at more or less risk depending on whether they're at a high flow state and a low flow state. And so low flow states are areas where there's not as much blood flow all the time. And this leads to areas where you can get buildup of those sickle cells, which causes those priapismic episodes. We do need to discuss one important thing and the difference between high flow priapism and low flow priapism, okay? So high flow priapism is something that occurs usually from trauma, believe it or not, but you get an increased arterial supply to the penis. And so you have high blood flow to this area and it causes the chambers to dilate and really in, results in priapism, okay? But what we're almost gonna be talking about in all of these cases moving forward is something that's called low flow priapism. In low flow priapism, you typically have venous obstruction and it causes the blood to stagnate in the corpora and you have low levels of blood flow, therefore you have low levels of oxygenation and you can have complications as a result. And so when you have sickle cell anemia, you can actually have many different reasons why you actually get a, a priapismic state. And so once again, it's not only from the sickling of cells, but what they looked at in this paper is that you can also have abnormalities in which because your hemoglobin is abnormal, you actually have abnormal rates of nitric oxide absorption into the hemoglobin. And I know it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but you can actually develop a, a priapism due to changes within the nitric oxide levels. And it actually leads to this feedback loop where you can have actually reduction of PDE5, which basically causes you to lose erections. And so so you almost have like a built-in Viagra because it's a PDE5 inhibitor. But from this paper, what's important in regards to PE is that when you have priapism that lasts greater than 12 hours, you tend to remain your erectile function. You can have some mild loss in erectile rigidity, but you don't have complete loss of function. It's actually if you have greater than 36 hours of prolonged priapism that you can have fibrosis and non-functioning scar tissue and basically loss of all penile function. One important thing which I thought was interesting in this paper is that they mentioned that, you know, I just talked about how your, your nitric oxide and PDE5 inhibition is, is altered, but what they've seen is that you can also have, when you supplement with PDE5 inhibitors like Viagra, it actually reduces your rate of penile fibrosis. And so they recommend all of these sickle cell disease patients actually go on Viagra when they're worried about that penile fibrosis occurring, because once again, it prevents that, which is why I preach to people that you probably need to be on a low dose of a PDE5 inhibitor while you're doing your PE. But also they noticed that when you supplement with PDE5 inhibitors, it can actually limit the rates of priapism, which I know sounds counterintuitive, but it's basically throwing that pathway into homeostasis. And so this paper is largely a background paper that I'm gonna to use to draw conclusions from moving forward. And so the next paper we're gonna look at is titled Circumferentially Acquired Macro Penis. And I think there's some more in the title, but it looks like the literature behind this event that occurs. And so it's largely looking at seven different cases of this phenomenon where you have enlargement of the penis, basically what happens, what happened to this guy's case and the literature behind it. And so in this case, a man ended up with a 21 centimeter girth or 8.3 inches. 
okay? But keep in mind that his penis was kind of shaped. It was kind of thinner up front and then dilated like this towards the back and then went back like that towards his shaft. And so it was not uniform, but this basically limited his sexual penetration with his partner, as you can imagine, with 8.3 inches. Up note, they mentioned that there was no jelking, extending, or any kind of penis enlargement techniques that were in, that were used, negative for sickle cell, uh, negative for any trauma, or even any history of priapism. I thought it was interesting, I put up on the screen right here, uh, that the actual um, MRI where you can see how the chamber dilates. What they described was an aneurysmal dilation of the tunica and in order to fix that basically what they did which I'll give you the cartoon version is that they did a like a semilunar shaped cutout around the tunica put it together, sewed it up, and then put a patch on top of that to strengthen the tunica in that area to prevent this from happening again. They actually show the photos from the surgery, which if you're squeamish, don't check it out. Uh, but if you uh, are not squeamish, it's a very interesting paper. And I'll try to leave a link to this paper in, in the description here. But basically, they reviewed the literature, and there's some, a couple of important points. Number one, the cases never involve the glands, and so never involve the head of the penis, and they typically develop over months to years. And of note, of these cases, which in the literature they reviewed, almost all of them are related to sickle cell, but all of them had functional penises. The only one that did not have a functional penis had a prolonged episode. Once again, we're talking about longer than 24 hours, close to that 36-hour mark, um, that you do not regain penile function after that. What they did notice is that when you have idiopathic enlargement, meaning just spontaneous enlargement. It is not only present uh, while erect, but usually, especially when there's like a sickle cell priapismic event involved, is you get dilation of the tunica, and so you have enlargement of both your flaccid and erect sizes, okay? On this paper, this is very interesting. And so they said that girth enlargement ranged from 6.2 inches or 16 centimeters to 25 centimeters or 9.8 inches. So keep in mind is that one guy dilated to 6.2 inches and still underwent reduction surgery for that girth. And so I know everybody's worried about getting to that six inch girth and everybody wants that, but this guy, it was too big for intercourse with their spouse. And so keep in mind, guys, bigger is not always better. I don't know how many times I have to say that, but one key point to all of these patients is that the tunica opogenia was thinned in all of the patients, meaning there was a thinning, so it was easier to stretch, easier to dilate. And they also mentioned the paper that I brought up in the Does a Size Matter video I made with that same sex toy paper. And so when these guys underwent surgical correction for their penises, none of them exceeded 5.9 inches, which they said was the max girth dimension for insertable intercourse. And so it's a key thing to keep in mind. And so a couple other papers, this next paper we'll talk about, there was um, significant enlargement after um, an episode of priapism that related in permanent dilation. And once again, this was a sickle cell patient, but what they theorized is that the loss of elasticity, so your tunica is supposed to stretch and then come back, stretch and then come back. What they describe is that your tunica actually stretches and dilates and actually stays that way is the theoretical mechanism for why this occur. In this paper, though, they recommended that no surgical intervention be performed because there was no uh, sexual function was intact and there was no inhibition on this guy's sex life. This last paper we'll talk about is actually a 17-year-old guy that uh, unfortunately dilated to the point um, that it was too big for uh, intercourse after three priapismic episodes. And once again, if you actually look at the paper, you can see that aneurysmal, meaning the wall of the chamber dilates and kind of almost ruptures and enlarges uh, it doesn't rupture, rupture means break, but it just dilates to the point where there's, it balloons out and becomes significantly bigger. You know, th this is once again, another paper. So we have all of this medical literature of this occurring. And so what frustrates me is when even medical professionals and doctors are like, oh, it's, it's impossible to enlarge a penis. It's like, what the fuck do you mean? Like clearly here's three different papers, at least three different papers showing that this phenomenon occurs and it's medically documented and it happens, okay? And so yes, you can enlarge your penis, even regardless of the extender studies, regardless of any of that shit, this is proven medical science showing that you can in fact enlarge your penis. What I'd like to do now is just talk about like, how is this applicable to PE? And you know, what are my takeaways from it? And so number one, not gonna belabor the point too much, but this is possible. There's literally medical literature showing that this occurs. And so how I believe this relates to PE is that you have, the way I think about PE is a chronic dilation of the tunica and a chronic stretching of the actual tunica 
tunica and penile tissues. Kind of controversial, I guess, but I don't believe that there's really a an injury response that plays into this. I mean, and if so, it's minor. I don't think it's a major part of it. And I know, like, you know, me and BD differ on that. And it's okay to differ on opinions, guys. But that that's personally what I believe is what we are doing is hyperinflating the tunica. And so, you know, you you have your tunica, you get a normal erection, and then you have to push past those normal erection pressures to dilate that tunica, and that permanently enlarges over time. And as I mentioned before, in these papers, you can see that they have a chronic enlargement in both the flaccid and erect states, and that's due to that dilation of the tunica. Key thing is also that thinning of the tunica albuginea is key. Okay, I do believe there are some guys that are just not going to grow, and it's because for whatever reason, their genetic structure, they have very thick or very strong tunica, and they're not going to get that dilation because, guys, think about it. You know, there's there's millions of people with sickle cell disease. The majority of them are going to have these priapismic episodes, but not all of them are going to have that dilation. What is the difference? Probably the tunica, the tunica integrity. There's some guys that are prone to having a more dilated tunica or a more thin tunica, and that can lead to the enlargement that they see because these are case reports when this happens, this doesn't happen to everybody, but it doesn't mean that we can't apply it. And so I do believe that having a thin tunica or a tunica that's more prone to dilation is part of the key to guys that have faster gains. And, you know, I myself actually might be one of those guys based on what I've seen. Uh, the next thing that, that I'll discuss is that I think that chronic exposure to pressure causes the tunica to dilate and enlarge. And so in most of these papers, these guys have, especially these sickle cell guys, have chronic episodes of priapism. So an episode, they get priapismic and they have this intense pressure and then the episode resolves. Okay, intense pressure with next priapismic episode and then it resolves. And that is what causes that chronic dilation. And I believe in the second paper that I mentioned in the study, that's what you see. And so that's why I believe that I mean, that's why I basically pump the way I do is because it's exceeding that your chronic exposure to brief intervals, but of intense pressure in the penis that are going to lead to that chamber to chronically diagnose all the time. Another thing, you know, I don't hear about as much anymore, but I personally think that tunica strengthening is kind of bullshit. I've said that before, and that's no offense to people who believe it. I know BD was a proponent of this at some point. I think he's, I haven't heard him mention it in a while, but if that were the case, these guys with sickle cell disease, this wouldn't happen because they would have these priapismic episodes with intense pressure, then their body would be like, oh shit, that was intense pressure, we're going to strengthen this connective tissue, and then you wouldn't see this chronic dilation. And once again, so this is evidence for that, but then there's also something that's called an aortic aneurysm, or just aneurysms in general, when you get this chronic dilation. So for those that don't know, the aorta is the main vessel comes off your heart, okay? And it actually has a tunica. It's literally called a tunica as well. And what you can have is, especially in people that are prone to this or have high blood pressure, that, that tunica chronically dilates over time. And so if tunica strengthening was a real thing, then when you put these people that have aortic aneurysms on blood pressure medications to lower that pressure, you would actually see that the aortic aneurysm would correct itself. But instead, even when you put them on blood pressure, you still have to monitor that because it continues to enlarge over time. And so I just, I personally think that, you know, pumping at high pressures is going to prevent you from having gains in the future. I think that's total bullshit. No offense to anybody that believes otherwise. I'm not the authority on this. I'm just examining the medical literature and that's what I come to. Okay. I think that flaccid increases that you see with PE, once again, it's due to, I think, partially loss of the tunica uh, over time with that overexpansion, which is not a bad thing. Once again, you maintain your sexual function, but when you are chronically dilating that tunica, it's almost like, I don't know, a piece of elastic. You know, if you keep stretching it, keep stretching it, keep stretching it, it's going to stay in a more stretched state. And so that's part of the reason why you have flaccid gains. And then obviously you can have some uh, erect gains from that. I I do think that tunica malleability training makes more sense now. Before I was like, yeah, yeah, that's kind of bullshit. Um, like hocus pocus PE hand waving, like they're so prevalent in this field. No offense to anybody, that's just my opinion, okay? But it does make more sense now that you can actually partially condition the tunica to be in a state where it's thinner or more prone to dilate and more you're more prone to get experience. I personally don't do specific tunica malleability training, but I do stretches and such a way prior to my girth work that I do believe it's it's what's working my tunica and helping it to expand a little better. So this is actually a key point here. So I like for everybody to kind of listen up to this. And so 
pumping it causes high flow priapism. And so what does that mean? Once again, it means that when you pump, you can actually see that you have increased arterial flow into the penis. And so the blood flow is actually increased into the penis. And so you don't have those ischemic changes that occur with something like clamping. Clamping does more closely mimic these mechanisms that we're seeing here when we're talking about priapism because it's actually a low flow priapism state and so you obstruct the penis with the clamp and therefore blood has a hard time going in and blood has a hard time going out and so it's just trapped it's low flow into the penis now what does this mean you know I will admit okay I think that clamping has more potential for growth and girth than pumping does I do okay I think you can still get gains with pumping I think it's slower but pumping I think is much safer because it's a high flow priapism state where you're drawing in additional blood increasing oxygenated blood. Pumping is present. I'm not going to go on my pumping tangent right now, but in, you know, even things like shockwave therapy, they recommend you combine it with pumping because of that additional arterial blood supply that's brought in. And so just keep in mind that when you are clamping, you are in the slow flow state. You're at a much higher risk of permanent injury. But from these papers, we can see that permanent injury risk is actually pretty low, especially when you're talking about what clamping for 10, 20 minutes at a time, you know, that's, there's a lower chance that you're going to have permanent damage from that if you do it correctly, because, and you're, we're talking about once again, low flow damage, not the pressure damage, which you can overpressurize the penis by clamping. And I'm going to make a clamping video soon. I just haven't gotten around to it. The last point I'd like to make is that once again, this is an argument for being on low doses of PDE5 inhibitors, or at the very least being on something like a citron twice a day to increase that nitric oxide, to increase the chances that your endothelial cells are healthy and to minimize the risk of that fibrosis. Because I do think with all this chronic trauma that we are applying to the penis, which is PE, that uh, you need something that's going to limit your risk of fibrosis long-term. And by long-term, I mean like 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now, when you're 60 years old, some of you guys, not me, I'll probably be dead and gone. Um, but you want to still have a functioning penis and you don't want it to be secondary to the trauma that you did when you were a kid. It's like guys who continue to smoke and you know, yeah, you're smoking while you're young and you're fine, but then you hit 60 and you can't fucking breathe and you have COPD and emphysema and you have to be on oxygen and you're like, oh shit, I wish I would have listened to the doctors who told me not to smoke when I was a kid. So I think it's going to be something simpler. And I think that, you know, my biggest concern is actually not immediate trauma now, but actually long-term trauma. And so that's it for today's video, guys. I hope you learned something. If you're looking for a good citrulline supplement, uh, me and BD made a supplement. It's at leviathansubs.com. If you're looking for specific injury counseling or perhaps want my opinion on your PE routine. I'm not a PE coach, but you can find me on my Patreon slash Doc Hink, D-O-C-H-I-N-K. Of course, check me on Getting Bigger um, and I'll catch you guys on the next one. Do your own research, form your own conclusions. Peace.